This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thank you so much. That includes Tony Glass, Philip Less, and Daniel Dorado. Coming up on DTNS, Apple's new accessibility features include one that lets the phone speak in your voice and why it's perfectly natural to treat AI as if it's a human, but don't. It's a bad idea. We need to stop that. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From New York City, I'm Ayaz Akhtar. And I'm the show's producer, Amos. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have a fun-filled show full of philosophy and accessibility. Let's start with the quick hits. Good news on the Chinese tech front. Baidu beat revenue estimates for its first quarter, reporting revenue of 31.1 billion yuan, which is about 4.5 billion U.S. dollars, after launching its chatbot called Ernie in March. That's not all. Pandaily reported that AI program Midjourney is launching a beta test for its official Chinese version. The deal will have Midjourney come to QQ, that's Tencent's instant messaging platform and web portal. Seems to be a limited test. Midjourney originally posted on QQ that China-based users who want to try it out can do so Monday and Friday at 6 p.m. Beijing time, but it'll close the platform for the day once a certain number of people are using it. That explanation has since been removed, so a little unclear there, but it seems like there's a test, <laughs> Maybe so to speak. Maybe the word for Friday at 6 sounds like Tiananmen. Uh, a lot of very okay. small things to note today. Uh, I guess I would call these super quick hits or, or insta hits or something. Anyway, uh, the company that owns Drobo filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. That's the bad one. That means liquidation, not restructuring. Warren Buffett sold all his TSMC shares, saying tensions in the region are too great to consider it a safe investment. That's a bad sign. Twitter spent $10 million to acquire a job recruiting company called Lasky. If you're waiting for one password to start letting you store pass keys, that begins June 6th. Google is rolling out a fix for battery drain issues with its Pixel phones, and Google announced that starting in December, it will delete accounts that have been inactive for two years or more. Now, hmm. I just want to give a round of applause to Joe on video for actually getting a screen up for every single one of those. That was impressive, man. <laughs> WhatsApp is now rolling out a new chat lock feature that puts designated chats in a password or biometrically protected folder. When a user gets a notification that they've received one of these messages, they won't see the sender or message content. Not at first, anyway, until they do the right thing. Right now, chat lock uses a phone's own password protection, but WhatsApp says it plans to add support for custom passwords over the next few months. Good news and other news for Microsoft users. Here's the good news. Microsoft released its updated phone link app for iOS. We told you that was coming. Uh, it supports sending and receiving iMessages from a PC. Also lets you make and receive calls and see phone notifications. There's the other news as well, though. Security researcher Andrew Brandt posted on Mastodon that Microsoft began scanning password-protected zip files on SharePoint for malware. Now, that wouldn't be so bad if they were just scanning them from the outside, uh, but it does cause a problem since Brandt uses that service to back up and share malware with other researchers. So they need to be able to do that. Researcher Kevin Beaumont, however, also noted that Microsoft does this on other cloud services, but it appears to be a new behavior on SharePoint. And Microsoft apparently extracts possible passwords from the body of the email or the name of the file itself or uses a list of common passwords, but however it does it, it does crack in to your password protected zip file in order to do the scanning. Uh, zip file password protection is not particularly secure anyway, uh, but some people might take issue with them. Reuters sources say that LG Display is set to start supplying 2 million large OLED TV panels to Samsung Electronics starting next year. Initial panels are said to be high-end 77 and 83 inch models. You might say, well, hold on a second. Samsung has lots of large TVs, don't they? Yes, the company has its own display unit, but it mo uh, mostly focuses on smaller OLED panels for mobile devices. Yeah, so this is Samsung giving up on making the big panels and having to pay somebody else to make them instead. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, it, makes, it makes sense. Apple previewed new accessibility features Tuesday. Uh, let's run through them here. The first one, uh, at least a few of them, th there's a lot of them. Uh, personal voice is a feature for people who lose their voice. Uh, so you want to do this ahead of losing your voice. This is 
for something where you might know it's coming, uh, but it can synthesize your voice to make the phone sound like you. Uh, either out loud or maybe on a phone call or something like that. Uh, the on-device machine learning feature needs you to record 15 minutes of audio with the person reading text prompts. It then integrates with live speech, which is a feature of iOS that lets you type words and then the voice reads them. It'll be available at launch in English uh, for devices running on Apple Silicon. So you could do it on a Mac as long as you've got an M1, M2, or potentially in the future M3 Mac. One of the questions I had uh, initially was like, because I, I lose my voice like, once a year. So for a week, I sound either crazy or I can't really talk at all. I guess that could be helpful, but that's not really what this is for. This no, would be no, for some is, sort of degenerative yeah, situation if you have like where ALS and yeah. you're like, I know my voice is going, let me record it now while mm -hmm. I've still got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To preserve it in a way that probably couldn't be re replicated easily. Otherwise, unless you have, I don't know, just a treasure trove of you know recorded stuff of yourself already Pretty but you cool. have to have the exact phrases that the machine learning wants because yeah, it does need particular phrases what I'm looking at is the fact that it's on machine and Apple's got a pretty good history generally of privacy because if you're thinking about voice samples being up in a cloud and then it's going to be analyzed, brought back down, all that stuff, that shouldn't be happening on these devices, which is pretty neat, assuming all stuff, stuff stays secure. As for just 15 minutes of audio, that's not a lot of time. If you think about generating out all kinds of different words, I think this is pretty cool. And like a voice, it's an incredibly powerful thing to hear, you know, like being able to hear somebody else's voice again who's lost, lost that ability. It's, it means a lot. Yeah, this this sort of thing is only going to get better and better to the point where I wonder at some point in the future, uh, will I be able to do my show sounding like this, even though I'm you know 95 or something? Well, and yes, some people get a little bristly when you talk about accessibility features who are for the people who really need them, but can be used by everyone. You know, if you know, if there if there were situations where I could I could I could train personal voice to use my voice and for whatever reason, I don't need to use my actual voice at the moment. You know, that's there. There's some yep. use cases for that, too. Uh, next one here is assistive access. So this streamlines your core apps on iPhone and iPad to make them easier to use. Uh, this is meant for people with cognitive disabilities. So, uh, for example, when my dad was alive, uh, after he had a stroke, this would have been great for him. There are modified versions of messages, camera, photos, and music, and a combined phone and FaceTime app. They put them together, make it simpler to use. Basically, strip it down to its essential features. They also have high contrast buttons, large text labels, and it's available in multiple languages. English, French, Italian, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, and Cantonese. So I assume that means Mandarin and Cantonese, Korean, Japanese, and Ukrainian. Yeah, this reminds me a lot of Samsung's easy mode. They used to have that on their Galaxy devices. I don't know if they still support that. I know my Note 20 still has it. Basically, all the icons get really large. You got to uh, hold and press buttons or, or icons so that way they'll be activated, not by mistake, but by intention. I mm -hmm. think when I took a look at these streamlined versions of the apps, I saw the camera app and I was like, oh, that looks great. So it's got a button that says take photo. I'm not, I'm not uh, knocking iOS at all, but there's a lot of features that creep in and to a point where you know a lot of people that have been using iPhones for a long time, they forget that all this feature creep can be somewhat um, confusing to somebody who's just looking at how do I take a picture exactly? How exactly do I switch what camera I want? Mm -hmm. So some of these um, app uh, streamlining, I think, could be useful for more than just this feature. And it's it's uh, it's not in Apple's best business interest to take away those features because a lot of those features are meant to you know get you to do things that Apple would mm -hmm. like you to do, but they're doing it anyway for accessibility to just make it easier for a certain class of of users to be able to use their their stuff. Hey, I mean, half the time I'm like, where is this feature? I know it's in here somewhere. So, mm -hmm. you know yeah. what I mean? And uh, you could argue that I already have some cognitive disabilities. But uh, for, you know, people like you mentioned, Tom, you know, somebody who is um, who is recovering after a stroke and learning how to do some things a little bit differently, this makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, the next one is a new detection mode called Point and Speak. This is in the existing magnifier tool. Uh, so it provides assistance for low vision users interacting with physical objects with text labels. Uh, one of the examples they gave is a microwave. Uh, so it can read out the labels, uh, like say for the buttons on the microwave, as you move your finger over them. It'll be like popcorn button, time cook, stuff like that. Mm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's going to work with uh, iPhones and iPads that have the LiDAR scanner. So you're going to need one of the newer ones. You've got like iPhone 6 or something. Yeah, it's yeah. It's kind of old. Uh, and it's going to be working in a lot of different languages. When I saw this little little demo in action from Apple's site, it seems incredibly useful. You just basically put your camera over something. It, the camera will read what's on like the microwave in this example. It'll say popcorn, and you'll be able to move your hand to the right so you can hit something else. It's It seems like a really useful and amazingly powerful use of technology. Yeah. Like, like I, every now and then I look at phones, I'm like, what is all this stuff for? It's so powerful. I wonder for if this would like be good this. on like a vending machine. Like would it, you know, to tell you the Could options. Be. Yeah. yeah any, especially something that you're, you know, maybe I'm so familiar with my microwave that I could, you know, yeah, you, right. know you know, in the but dark, it's like, I know where the objects. button is. Yeah. But yeah. If you're out and about. Cause and, I'm thinking and, like ticket kiosks at subways and stuff usually have a lot of assistive capabilities built into them. Maybe they're not that great cause I never use them, but they're, they're there. But I'm trying to think of cases where they wouldn't be built in that this could be, this could or be this, or, or this is just easier. Yeah. Uh, there are several more updates. Uh, that Apple announced. If you go to apple.com, uh, these tools and the others arrive on their respective platforms later this year. If you're excited about using one of these, I apologize. Sorry, no firm date from Apple yet. Well, Vancouver's Sanctuary Cognitive Systems Corporate just announced a bipedal robot called Phoenix. Phoenix is five foot seven inches, weighs 155 pounds, and can lift up to 55 pounds at a time and move at up to three miles per hour. Phoenix's hands have five fingers with 20 degrees of freedom that come pretty close to human dexterity. The hands also have haptics to deliver feedback to the computer as the robot touches and lifts things. Phoenix was tested at a Mark's retail store where it completed 110 retail-related tasks, including front and back of store activities like picking up and packing merchandise, cleaning, tagging, labeling, folding, and more. It runs on the company's carbon machine learning platform to execute these tasks. Sanctuary Cognitive Systems makes a point that its videos aren't renders, but actual video of the robot in action. So, you know, it's pretty promising. That said, there's no talk of selling Phoenix or who it's actually marketed for. I, as we assume this is more for that retail environment and not for your home, but if you could buy Phoenix, what would you pay? Uh, I probably would realize there's no way I could ever pay for something like this. It would be super expensive. I'm sure it'll be on like the the Sanctuary Cognitive Systems Corporate Subscription Plan Plus Premium Ultra, or whatever the heck's going to be, and it'll cost yeah, twenty thousand dollars a year plus overhead. And, yeah. and they take care of maintenance, and maybe there's yeah, like a yeah. free electrical charger when it's walking with me to the supermarket or something. Uh, but when I was looking at this, because we in, in regular human life, not so much like in factories and things, we have so many single pur purpose robots like Roombas and mops and lawnmowers, and if you go into automotive space you got a ton of those kinds of robots these robots if and they're not that tall not that short five foot seven 155 means it could sit in a human chair it is you don't need like specially um reinforced grounds or, or floors or anything to make sure that this robot doesn't mm -hmm. like crash through so there's a lot of things about it that seem interesting the dexterity to me i'm this the only thing I keep thinking about and this is this is completely narrow-minded stupid and silly I just want it to fold the laundry I know that there's machines out there to do that, but this is what I would use it for because I hate folding laundry. I know that makes no sense, but I if it's no, so no, it that, makes, that part makes perfect I don't know. sense. Yeah. With its yeah, fingers, I mean, I'm like, just these little things. That way yeah. I don't need to have a special robot uh, washing machine and a robot dryer or any of that stuff. Let's just go ahead and give it to Phoenix because Phoenix can do it. Although Phoenix looks a lot like Chappie. I just wanted to get that in. I, it does look a lot like Chappie. Uh, this company is obviously looking for investment. Uh, they are making a point of, like Sarah said, this is not a render. It's a real product. Uh, it's able to do actual things. If they are able to make this work, uh, which it sounds like they can, it's impressive. I'm not sure if it can reach a price point that makes it work for the situations it's needed for. Because at a scale where you can afford hundreds of thousands of dollars for a machine like this, you probably want a more specialized machine. Um, maybe something more like a Boston Dynamics. This is a more humanoid general purpose robot. It feels like retail is a great use case for it, but can mm -hmm. you bring it down to a point of price that makes sense for like a mid-level retail store in a mall to be able to have this thing, you know, stocking stuff and, and, and going through inventory in the back. Cause I feel like it could do that. Like, I feel like it's possible it could do that. I just don't know if it could do it cost effectively or not. I mean, anybody who's been to, I don't know, uh, <laughs> I know a lot of us aren't going into physical retail stores as much as we used to, although we're, we're coming Actually, back. Physical retail is 
back to booming now. Is, yeah, is the but, well, sure. So, so I think you know a lot of companies that are maybe in that mid-level range. Uh, are trying to think of, you know, at the end of the night, right? If anyone's worked at retail, you know, it's like store closes, half the lights go down, and then the employees work for another couple hours, making everything look nice again. You know, it, in that situation, you don't care if a robot is humanoid or not. You're just trying to get things done. So that's sort of one use case. If this was more of a, well, Phoenix is walking around among us, you know, doing some stuff, um, doing some light stuff during the day. I could see certain retail chains saying, this is perfect. Yeah. You know, this is something that'll be like fun for the consumer and not, you know, weird or otherwise kind of make a mess of That's a really store good point. Otherwise. Because the advantage is that it's general purpose. It could do anything a human can do because it's got the fingers, it's got the mobility. You know, if you build a special purpose ro robot, even if it's got multiple purposes like a Boston Dynamics one, there are going to be things that it can't do. And also, to your point, it'll scare the customers. <laughs> this one <laughs> right. could be made where it's like, oh, it's a fun robot. That's it. That's, you know, and it becomes a perk while it's also doing its job. I was just exactly. thinking about this. If, if any, like, super premium luxury apartments would have them as their doorman slash concert because mm -hmm. they just, they'd be there all the hotels time. So the, the building too, itself, yeah. I, I would imagine Las Vegas hotels will have this like in no time. But like the building itself is actually the the owner of the robot. It just interacts with you like, hey, want my packages here, Chappie? And it's like, no, go away. <laughs> no package for you today. I don't know why the robot has an accent. I'm not even sure what accent it has. Uh, <laughs> if you would like to hear me put on an accent, uh, tell us in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Senior lecturer in mathematics at the University of Greenwich, Neil Saunders, wrote an article on the conversation called AI, Evolution is Making Us Treat It Like a Human and We Need to Kick the Habit. He notes and agrees with other folks who say we need to stop treating AI agents as conscious and moral with interests, hopes, and desires. But he adds... That's actually tough for us. It's easy to say stop doing it. It's hard for humans to do it because we evolved to treat things as if they're human. Cognitive scientist Daniel Dennett coined a phrase called intentional stance, which kind of helps describe the tendency of humans to treat any object as a rational agent in order to fully explain its behavior. Our ability to do that helped us survive as a species. It's a refinement on anthropomorphizing things. Saunders gives the example of chess. So when we compete with a computer playing chess, we treat it as if the computer wants to win, right? That helps us drive our competitive edge. But the computer is just executing a program. It has no awareness that it's even playing chess, much less that it's playing against you. Uh, we do this sort of thing with a lot of things. We do it with pets. We even do it with stuffed animals and rocks. But in Dennett's words, we treat things as human even if they have competence without comprehension. So knowing this, and, and, and this is a little philosophical, I get it. Do, do you think this can help us deal with the disruption of AI, Ayaz? Can it help us deal with the disruption? I, I don't know. It's like just knowing, like... Okay, I shouldn't be treating this thing like a human. You know that that's going to get me in trouble. I think it's going to take some time for this. Well, this is like going to be the first generation kind of growing up with this because we've had lousy chatbots before. We've seen lousy scamming of uh, text messages before. There was a great quote in the Substack article that that we have linked. It says, "What we need for the, is for the public to learn that human-sounding speech isn't actually necessarily human anymore." Caveat emptor. That's <laughs> that to me. I'm like that actually That's explains a new. lot. Because yeah. to us, like you know, it used to be like there was phone etiquette. You could call anybody anytime; it'd be normal. Now you text before you call. Like all these etiquette changes that happen over time. And I think a lot of this is because we do have a tendency to humanize things all the time. We need essentially marketing. And I was thinking about this in terms of. Uh, animals and like farmed animals versus wild animals. You don't go to the supermarket and buy a, a half a pound of cow. You buy half a pound of beef. You don't get a half a like you don't get like a you don't get pig. You get pork or you get bacon. If you call this something else, mm. if you call it rational agent or you call it a uh, human hating machine or something, <laughs> maybe people will then maybe go, wait that. a second, I, I have to be a little bit more cold to this because I still say thank you to Google Home. I say thank you to these yeah. things all the time because I think it's rude if I don't do it, but. I have to learn that this is a device that is probably fe fueling all kinds of advertisements for me, but it, it, it's called Google Home. It's my friend. It's my buddy. So but like, it's, it's called Chat GPT. That's not a particularly 
friendly human sounding name and we and we still have people doing it i i catch point, myself I, well I, I mean i mean remember it wasn't it was just a couple months ago where chat gpt was the hot new thing that everybody was trying out and it's like look chat gpt said that i was mean yeah and you know it was it said that i i, I was you know right not not a very nice person and has some issues with me and you know that is you could argue well okay it's a human at fault but from the beginning right chat gpt didn't do that on their own but it's still the humans being like well that was very human like and not very nice although i as your point about you know, this, this, getting a phone call right like let's say it's a robo call we're all pretty familiar with robocalls, right? Especially the one where it's like, hi, oh, sorry, there's something wrong with my headset. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Dot, dot, dot. And then they go into whatever, you know, trying to get money out of you. You know, that has become this extremely annoying thing that we can now pick up on because it's a scam. But it was, it was good for a while um, and probably is still fooling lots of people because it sounds like a human and we're used to talking to something that sounds like a human, no matter what it is. Yeah, there's going to have to be some, some kind of, I guess like, I wouldn't say human evolution, but sort of something like that. It's going to be a learning experience for a lot of us to figure out, what am I reading? And if there are actual rules that all things need to, need to be disclaimed, like let's say you're reading an article or you're watching a video that was AI generated or images that are AI generated, if there is a watermark of some kind that literally we all agree to, we all agree this has to be done, then it'd be helpful. If we don't agree to that, and there's no standards on this, this could be well, a real you, problem. You both are starting to talk about combating fraud. That's not yes. actually what Saunders, Saunders wasn't even getting there. He acknowledged that in the article. He's like, yeah, there's, there's things about fraud. He's like, but even before that, to regulate this properly, to treat it properly, to use it properly, to think about it properly, we have to remember that it is just a tool, that it yeah. has no awareness. Before we even get to like, yeah, of course, bad actors are going to make use of it. And that's actually harder to deal with because we won't know it's chat GPT behind it. They'll try to hide that. But even when we know, oh, this is Project Bard, this is Bing, this is chat GPT, we have to remember that it isn't thinking. It isn't insulting you when it says you're mean. It's mm -hmm. just predicting words and spewing them out. And and what Saunders pointed out is if that feels hard when you're trying to do it, that's right. You're you're not there's nothing wrong with you. That's human evolution. We have evolved to think of things as human that seem human. Even pets which, you know, yeah, they have their own desires and stuff, but they're different. We anthropomorphize them. We treat them human. But there are times when an animal, even a pet, a dog or a cat, has behaviors that are not human. And it's important as a pet owner to not treat them human in those cases, right? Uh, mm -hmm. There's great examples of that. And we, we need to, maybe we need to treat uh, text generators as pets. You know, I, as you saying that you sometimes say thank you to Google Assistant, I do the same to uh, Amazon yeah, yeah, Assistant. Yeah, that's an example of this. Yeah. And, it, you know, the, I know it doesn't matter. I mean, maybe, I don't know, a thank you gets recorded or, you know, you know, it gets chalked up to like, you know, maybe I get like cool person points somewhere in the, you know, in the ether somewhere. No, but that's not, I don't have to say anything nice to this thing that is not a person, but it sounds so much like a person. And that's how a lot of these products have been marketed to people. Like, it's not a person, but it's going to be real nice and conversational and it's going to sound very human-esque. So you're not freaked out and you, you know, can more or less uh, speak. I mean, you still have to use, you know, certain keywords and whatever, but you can treat it as if it is a human. Very much not, though. It sounds like you're talking about a, like a public relations person. Like competence without comprehension. Like this is what people do. That's the weird thing. That's why I think it's so hard. I've met a lot of people that don't seem to have, like understand. PR what's going people on. have comprehension. You're just saying maybe they're comprehending a different thing than you want them to comprehend, Perhaps. right? Perhaps. Yeah. Because they're humans. There's some. The, there's the difference there's, is the AI doesn't have comprehension. Right, it doesn't even. Part. It doesn't even know it's doing it wrong. Uh, it doesn't even know it's fooling you. It doesn't know. That's the key. It doesn't know at all. There's no. There's no there's knowing. No consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's a tough one. Well, I know what we do know, and that is what NBC, Universal, and the NFL are announcing. I'll tell you now. They signed a one-year deal to have Peacock exclusively stream one NFL playoff game next season. Just one. The game will be the wild card game on January 13th, 2024, and won't be available on national TV or cable. Local markets will have access to the game through local TV channels, but otherwise... Got to go through Peacock. Yeah, and presumably uh, bars will get it through DirecTV. That's something a lot of people don't realize is DirecTV commercial service for bars carries these games that are on Amazon Prime and Apple yeah. TV and stuff. <laughs> That's why 
the bar always has the game. Yeah, yeah. The bar like, still well, has the game. Why can't I get it at home? So uh, this this reminds me of when they first put some playoff games for Major League Baseball on the MLB channel. And there were people who didn't get the MLB channel on their cable system. Like they, they couldn't get it. They, that wasn't an option. Uh, and people got really upset. The only difference being uh, with Peacock, as long as you have the bandwidth. So if you don't have the bandwidth, you can't get it. But if you have the bandwidth, uh, then you just it's whether you can afford the price. Uh, if you want to pay the five to ten bucks to get Peacock, then you can get it. It's nice that you can get it from anywhere that has Peacock. That's great, but like In the US, I'm just thinking, yeah, the 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 annoyance of trying to figure out where is what game on at what given time. This has become such a pain in the neck. Uh, like I have to like I have like special routines that I do to find out where the Yankees game is going to be on. You know, NBA basketball is like on four different networks. There's like it's getting so so split up. It's going to be a real pain in the neck to find this stuff. And I still don't think search is very good for this personally. I, not I, yet. I was, not yet. That's that's the, the, the hope for the future would be the platform would solve it. Like your Roku or your Google TV would be able to tell you, Hey, the game's on click here. And it wouldn't matter. It you'd hit the paywall if you don't subscribe and then you'd decide whether you want to get it or not. And I won't thank that search. I won't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. Don't do it. It doesn't know. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. We got one from someone who would like to remain anonymous who's hoping that AI could cut down on friends and family getting hit with spam and phishing attacks on social media and then passing them along to everybody else, which makes the problem worse. Use, used Facebook as, as an example. Anon says, it seems like an obvious formula. The user logs in from a new location. User spams all their friends with the same post containing a link. 30 people message the user saying, you've been hacked, or hey, I think you've been hacked, or my favorite, that link didn't work, who died? Uh, Anon says, I wasted 30 minutes trying to delete all copies of the spam recently before anybody else spread it. On a PC, I had to open every messenger chat, click on the hamburger menu, remove the post, click remove. Facebook scrolls to the top of the list. I scroll down, find where I left off, click the message 150 times. It seems like the company who's reading my messages to advertise to me would be able to recognize some pattern to this madness or even provide a way to mass delete the message that was mass sent. Yeah, I feel you, Anonymous. Um, however, uh, that always sounds right when you're dealing with the actual problem like you are. Uh, these companies, uh, even Facebook, run into huge problems if they try to implement a solution to prevent this uh, when it works in the wrong way because nothing works perfectly. And suddenly, somebody was trying to send a message to 100 people for their wedding and it got blocked by Facebook. And then there's the whole privacy kerfuffle and every, Facebook backpedals. That's part of the reason. The other reason is that this is an arms race. And so every time Facebook puts in a method to stop this kind of stuff, the bad actors figure out a way around it. Uh, and it isn't until those start happening that the engineers can see what they're doing and figure out a way to counter it. Indeed. Sad well, but true. Well, I, as I hope that you haven't had any mass spam emails or Facebook messages lately, but you know, if you have, you wouldn't be alone. Let folks know where they can keep up with the what work. What are you that spamming actually... people? Ayaz? <laughs> when did you stop spamming people, Ayaz Akhtar? <laughs> uh, and where can people find out where where your good work is happening these if, days? If you would like to be voluntarily spammed, as in you want to subscribe, <laughs> you go to thisoldnerd.com. It's a show where I show people how to, how to have the most tech-forward life and home as possible. The last episode was about mounting a sound bar on a really old TV and how that went. Tell you what, there were some uh, hiccups. But I went through the pain, so you don't have to, and you'll know how to do this stuff a lot quicker. So check it out at thisoldnerd.com. Go to the YouTube page and subscribe, all that fun stuff. We'll Indeed. You. And good to have you on the show today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Always a good day when Ayaz is with us. Also, I want to extend a special thanks to Christopher Nelson, one of our top Lifetime supporters. Christopher, we want to thank you right here, right now, for all the years of support. Yay! Thank you, Christopher. Uh, in fact... Uh, we have 1,400 new patrons that are free. Since we announced the new free tier last week, we have had 1,400 people uh, sign up to get Patreon perks for free. Uh, you just scroll down past the paid options at patreon.com slash DTNS. You get monthly updates, Roger's column, and Friday's Good Day Internet. So 
welcome. Well, you, yes, hopefully you can hear me like you're listening to the public feed uh, anyway. And if you want to get more perks, of course, they, they're they available whenever the money uh, loosens up for you. But thank you for becoming a patron, even at the free level, patreon.com slash DTNS. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. CNET's writers have decided to form a union. And since I, as and I worked there, uh, we have thoughts. We're going to tell you about them. You can also catch DTNS live at 4 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. That's 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Alice and Sheridan joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>